One of the things I was going to talk about that I mentioned is the way the input jacks get wired up. So this is one of Doug Hoffman's other pages that he is good for pretty much any app you're building. It's called his Common Hookups uh, file. It's a PDF. And he shows a single input jack versus a dual input jack. Uh, and so if you look, the single input jack and the dual both have the same kind of, sh the, the, the switched point of the jack to the ground, as well as a one meg ohm from tip to ground. But in this case, the one meg goes to the tip of the one, but the tip shares it not only its input, but the, the, the switched jack part of the other input. And so effectively, they share a commonality of the, the ground. But uh, one of the things that's actually kind of interesting is when you plug into this jack, you're actually sending your signal uh, just through 168K resistor off and through. And then you have the 1 meg ohm to ground. But if you connect into this second, well, actually, I might be saying it backwards. I think it's if you connect into this one, you have 1 meg to ground, and you also have 168K that goes this way. But when you connect into this one, you have a 68K that goes out, but you also send it through another 68K as well as the 1 meg to ground. So it actually changes the tonality of this. I'm going to try and find a, uh, and put in as the, the next part of this uh, is a, a cool uh, image where somebody shows with some highlighter how those work. And there's actually been like, I think, like master's level the thesis papers written about how uh, sharp or, you know, cool of an idea this was. Because effectively each input jack has a slightly different tone because of it. Um, but you still end up getting the uh, kind and quality of sound that you wanted of it. Um, also, I think one of them... One of them ends up, well, you, you effectively get still close to the 33. It's going to be 34K because they're in parallel. So they split that down, but that also means that each of them has a slightly distinctly different tone as to how they, they sound. So uh, I'll go through that. I'm probably explaining it wrong right now, but again, it is actually a little bit of a complicated but very cool concept that each of these is different. Another thing I'm going to show here in a minute is I'm going to wire these up before I put my board in because I'm going to be a bit tighter in space in this chassis. So effectively, one other tip I'd watch somebody do and I'd try is to instead of hooking the jacks on the front the normal the way that they would be is you turn them around so that they're outside of the chassis, you wire them up and then you turn them back around and put them in because they will be spaced perfectly at that point for it. So I'll show you that in a minute as well. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, one of the things I did mention is I wanted to cover a little bit about how the, the Fender typical high-low or n normal bright channels and jacks work. Uh, so this is a really cool website in general, Rob, robinette.com, R-O-B-R-O-B-I-N-E-T-T-E.com. Um, he has a lot of really cool stuff, but you know, one of the things here is this input jack section. You can see this at the top of his page here. Uh, I'll probably put the link over the text as well, just so you can read that. But the um, uh, he first covers this, and then also a little later, and we'll show that as well. It covers jumpering the input jacks, but effectively he shows a basic input schematic and also how the wiring is done. You remember I showed that on the previous video as well from Doug's layout. But um, one of the more important things he kind of covers just about how a normal and, and high uh, the bright inputs are different, which I don't necessarily want to cover, but I want to more show the actual math. If you look at just two of these two, you'll see uh, one of the things that impacts tone is what the grid. Uh, uh, stop the grid stopper resistor is but also the um I'm the r2 uh, it would be the one to ground that comes into the input itself that also can impact the tone so if you look both of these layouts affect uh, have the exact same uh, grid stop resistance of 68k but it's one meg in one case and it's 1.13 meg in the other so that alters the that grounding resistor that helps kind of create the bias um, of the tube a little bit or adjusts it so it effectively gives you a slightly different tonality um, for th the low jack versus the high jack. So that's kind of the, one of the nice things. Then also, another cool thing about a lot of amps, although not all will do this, but a lot of amps also in these situations can be jumpered, and he shows a picture of how the jumpering works. You put your guitar input into one here, and then you get another short cable and you jumper between the input channel here to here. And what that effectively does is your, your input is coming through here, but will come through also back to the other 68K to the other jack. Uh, and that will allow that to then be jumpered back into another input here, so you effectively get your guitar signal going to both preamp stages and merging into the next phase. So uh, jumpering is good on a lot of amps. I've done it with my Vox. It's it's a fairly common one in a lot of situations like this. But ultimately, this this is one of the cool things about uh, just the, how cool the design was by these original engineers that came up with the idea of not only for the slightly subtle change in that grounding scheme, but also being able to share these two and have identical grid stop resistance but slightly different of uh, that resistor that goes to ground so uh, and then this also uh, you know people kind of realize later they could also jumper these two together to create a cool new hybrid of both the normal and brilliant and you get a kind of a new tonal shaping based on that so uh, from that we'll continue on and show how this works but uh, uh, there you go
Okay, another thing that is a, an even better way of approximating this, it looks like I actually, uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but I think that Rob Robinette page that I showed is also a little off in that this is a better way of simulating if it was a single input jack what these are doing. And this is part of what I do explain in, another, in this video as well uh, in a little bit is that if you're if you're going through one of them, it's like two paralleled 68K, so you get 30, 34-ish K. But if you go through the other one, it's like that you're grounding the one half of it and you only get 68K through. Uh, and it's just the cool thing about it is instead of having to have a switch, the way those jacks are set up is you get this automatically. So it is a combination of both of those things. Not only do you have a slightly different resistance to ground, which is this, you know, in a in an input, there's the grid stopper, and then this one here, I, I'm forgetting the name, but effectively this is another important part of the way the grid works, uh, is this second uh, resistor here, and having that subtly change from 1.1 to kind of equaling that routing to ground as well makes it have a slightly different impedance there as uh, or not impedance is that the right word i'm thinking of resistance not impedance but it adjusts a little bit of the way the circuit works as well so it's kind of two different things you not only get a different resistance from the input into the grid itself depending on high or low but you also get a, a slightly different grounding scheme as well so it's kind of a double whammy of really cool stuff going on so rob robin had explained part of that and then this this picture i think should help you understand it, it's as if you had a switch here physically with a single input and you could switch between either paralleled 68 k resistors or grounding half of it and getting a single 68k okay really quickly you can see here that's the four jacks the normal way but like i said i'm going to switch them around so i'm going to do that now and then i'll show you again what i mean what the way that'll be easier to wire them up okay now you should be able to see uh, as i'd shown you before they connect together with the uh, tip of the one connecting to the switch side of the other uh, and then i'm going to be wiring it up but it's now it's out here because the spacing is identical all i have to do is pick that up rotate it 100 degrees, bring it back in and stick it back in once it's all soldered together. Shouldn't really move much, and then I've got it ready to go. And then all I have to do at that point, I'll have the uh, the two resistors coming out in a way. I'll just have to attach the actual connected wire from there over towards the tube inputs over, over here really quickly with just the wire and they're done. So I'm going to quickly wire those up and then I'll show you the aftershock. Okay, hopefully you can see that. <clears throat> I have the two 68Ks that I will tie into the line. I have a one meg that's connecting into that same joint that's in the middle, connecting over here to ground. And then it also, I've pulled its wire over here to the to the switch section, because as the drawing shows, you want a connection between switch and ground and the one, point meg, one, one meg ohm between tip and ground. So that just, I can use the wire from that to jump for that as well. I will then switch these back over again and then swap the two around there. I'll be good to go. All right, as you can see, I've got my... Uh, Jack's all wired in and the inputs to them. So the one input comes over here to pin seven and the initial first, you know, the input, normal input goes into the first one, which would be two, the grid of the first half of the triode. And the second one goes into pin seven, which is the second grid of the second triode or the second grid of that triode. Uh, and one of the things that I do at that point then is test continuity and whatnot. But remember when you're testing for things like continuity ground and resistance, you want to have a jack in with these kind. Because if not, this will go to ground and it's supposed to. That's to kind of help keep noise out of the jacks that aren't physically connected with the cable. Um, I'm not sure if that's very visible with, uh, with the kind of shot I've got. But if you look right here, it's a little bit of an angle, but there's a second um, metal blade and the hooked part that goes to your tip of your thing touches that when it's not got a tip in but as soon as the tip touches that it pushes it away and breaks ground and that's why it's called a, that's i think that's why it's called a switch jack if i remember right that's switch it's a switch that switches it off of being grounded um and uh effectively one of the other things again i'll, I'll try and explain this in more detail with uh, some images and whatnot in the video as we go along but when you connect um uh, the when you connect this up the resistance uh, although I don't think I have any visibility into my multimeter there, it's kind of, I'm trying to adjust and see if I can show it. Uh, you can kind of see there, it's not going to be great, but uh, if I connect that multimeter to, um, if I bring this over and touch it to say pin 7, and then I touch uh, the tip, I'm sorry, this would be pin uh, pin 2. You'll see I get 36K. But if I connect it to the bottom one, and to the same one, I get... Sorry, I'm up in the thing there. And I'm not getting a good connection. 30, I get 36K there as well. Um, I was getting different behavior a minute ago. I must be... I'm probably doing something wrong here. Um, it, you normally... 
each one of them is going to have a slightly different resistance because of the way that's set up. All right, so if you can see that, it's at zero resistance right now. I touch this one, and I get 76K. But if I pull this guy down and plug it in out here, and I touch it, I get 37K. So effectively, if you plug it into one, you're getting one resistance level to the other, depending upon how it has a route through to the input. Um, and that is, an, is the design of the fender input jack is that if you plug it in to one of the inputs, you get a certain resistance, another one, you get another one. They kind of used to call them, I think, high and low jacks as well. Just the differences in those resistance between 36K and, or 33K and 60, you know, 68-ish K, it slowly but surely changes subtly that. And we'll show a little diagram that explains that. So uh, there you have it. Again, like I said, the, the, the trick you can watch, you gotta watch out for is you gotta make sure you have an actual plug in to remove that ground. That's kind of a, as old Dave, says from EEV blog, that's a trap for young players. And uh, I've caught myself in it several times trying to figure out why things seem to screw and then I remembered, oh, I don't have a jack and that's why it's being weird. So anyway, uh, as you also can see over here, I think that's visible on screen, that I've got the board in now as well. So I just connected that in. I haven't really connected much of anything to it yet. But uh, as I work on this this weekend, I will be effectively starting to connect more in. I also spent a little time a minute ago, uh, let's see if we can pan over there and get focused. All right, if you look, you can see I've got the blue and brown wires here. Those are the primary windings of the output transformer that will connect to, that are connected to pin uh, three on the output tubes. And then this is the center tap of it that will connect over here to A, as well as I have the um, standby switch that will connect to A, and the um, this is the center tap of the main primary power winding as well. And then the only other wire that I have really, other wires I'll have to connect that are loose are, this is the bias one that fits in, I don't remember where, I think it's either here or somewhere, somewhere in the bias circuit here. And then the other one I have left is this, which is going to be the, um, this is the choke, and that connects between, one will go here, and one will go here. And now, this is a filtering thing, a choke doesn't need, there's no polarity, that's why they're both black. All it really needs to do is have the circuit go through it. And the way an inductor or choke works is that it resists changes in current and in and uh, so or, well i think it's it resists changes in both current and in voltage but i may be wrong if you guys can remember let me know but effectively when you have these ripples in the in the voltages that you're trying to clean up the choke is able to whenever it that little ripple happens it forces it from being able to, to come back down a little bit so it's it's a good another type of filter just like your capacitors are a type of filter so but the way a capacitor works is it, when it's it takes a second or two to charge up, but then it has extra charge in it so that if the voltage starts dropping, it releases some of its charge. Then when the voltage goes back up to peak, it's able to draw back in again. And it forms almost like a mini battery job right there in the middle of the circuit. It just kind of takes in a little charge when it's at a peak, and it drains back out when it gets low, and that allows it to keep more consistent flow. So, all right, everybody, we will give you more shots as we progress along through the, the uh, build. So, um, thanks, everybody. Keep your amps biased hot and the jams coming.